You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is James Donovan. Flesh, Blood, Steel, the new book from David Allen Jones. 16-year-old Jake Harris wakes up after a horrific car accident to find 13 years have come and gone. He is 29 years old, a cyborg, and one of the world's most feared assassins. Horrified by the things he's done, things he can't remember, Jake vows never to kill again. Unfortunately, the company that owns Jake has other plans. They're not about to lose their top hitman to the errant memories of his teenage self. When Jake manages to escape them, they launch a worldwide manhunt that ranges from a near-future New York City to Paris. Desperate to remain himself, Jake joins a rebel faction dedicated to wresting control of the world's governments from the hands of militarized corporations. Using his enhanced body and perceptions, he is able to aid them in their fight. But Jake doesn't realize the rebels have their own plans for him, ones that involve unleashing his unique talents on their enemies. Faced with a dark past he can't recall and uncertain whom he should trust, Jake must come to terms with the sinister choices that molded him into the man he became. The question is, can he avoid doing it all again? Assassins aren't born, they're programmed. Flesh, Blood, Steel by David Allen Jones. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have James Donovan, although he told me to call him Jim. So, uh, But on the book, it's James Donovan. Uh, he has a fantastic new book called Shoot for the Moon. Uh, I had an early release uh, copy of this book uh, uh, about a month or a month and a half ago, and, and I just got the final release. This is a fantastic, gorgeous book um, that hits all of the nostalgia points for someone like me who grew up when I did. And we're going to talk all about that in just a minute. Uh, welcome to the show, Jim. Hey, thanks, Hank. Uh, Jim, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, my mother was a big reader and instilled that in us uh, early when I lived in Brooklyn. And, um, she, her favorite book to read to us was, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, A Child's Garden of Verses. And, um, I still love that book. And, you know, when I was little, uh, in school, I did some writing. Uh, hell, when I was in, um, I think ninth grade, I wrote an entire science fiction novel longhand, turned it in for a writing assignment. My teacher kind of shocked when I gave her this 200 page thing, but uh, <laughs> I think I got an A just, just for effort. <laughs> I love that. I love it. What, what was the, uh, you know, I, I love to, um, uh, to ask people about early encouragement, uh, that they got. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's a parent. Sometimes it's a teacher. Uh, when they recognize that gift in a child, did, uh, what, other than just being astounded by the size of the work, uh, did the teacher, uh, you know, recognize the storyteller gene in you? Yeah. She was actually the first. I, um, we had four kids, so, uh, you know, my mother was pretty busy. I didn't get that much encouragement from her about writing as, as much as reading. Um, but um, that teacher in ninth grade, uh, Mrs. Allmiller, I remember her. She was enthusiastic and uh, prompted me to keep on writing and submit submit things to the annual high school literary magazine, you know, things like that. <laughs> sure. Um, the, when did you become interested in – uh, in, in history? You know, I wasn't that interested in history as a kid. I read nothing but, uh, the first book my mother bought me as an, an adult book, quote unquote, an adult book was, uh, I think I was about eight or nine and she bought me Tarzan of the Apes one day when I was sick. And, uh, I read that, I think I finished it that night 
and went out and bought everything by Edgar Rice Burroughs, who, of course, wrote uh, the Mars series, lots of science fiction. Sure. Um, I got I got into that and didn't read anything but science fiction until I got into high school. I didn't even much uh, like history until, oh, maybe 20 years ago. I'm, I'm in my early 60s. So, uh, you know, you get older. I think it's just a natural progression. You get older and you start getting more interested in history. You know, a lot of these history organizations – uh, you know, their average age is a lot higher and they're always bemoaning the fact that there's not any younger uh, members and they're trying to figure out outreach ways to get to people in elementary school. You know, it's it's just a natural thing. People become more interested in history, I think, as they get older. Well, you know, we, we have a lot of guests on the show, especially in the last year, year and a half, um, that specialize in historical fiction. And there uh, is just this new wave of authors that are writing stories, especially early 20th century. World War II is really hot right now. And I, I think it has to do with, with the, the more distance we get between us and an event. Um, we don't want to lose those stories, uh, that are, uh, that are wrapped up in those time periods. And the farther we get away, the more things get reduced down to, to bullet points, um, I guess. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I definitely understand that the older we get, the farther we get away from things, the more we want to make sure they're not lost, maybe. But I think that's a good point. Um, you know, and there's a thing. Uh, it's a thing. I mean, you know, quote unquote, a thing. It really happens if you've lived through something uh, and can remember it. And I don't know how old you have to be to remember something vividly. Remember six, seven, eight, something like that. But it, it's a real thing, and you're sure it happened, and it's vivid. But if you haven't, and it happened before you were alive or could remember anything, you know, I, I noticed this among younger people, it might as well have happened, you know, a thousand years ago. Right. So some things in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, the space race, while I was doing this book for the past four years, younger people, you know, there's actually a, uh, way too many of them who don't think it really happened. Because they didn't, they didn't live through it and they don't, they're not absolutely sure of it. And, you know, it might have happened. It's kind of sad. So historical fiction, uh, I think uh, I love good, a good historical novel. And yeah. uh, that's a good point you made. Uh, well, and speaking of, you know, the uh, increasing numbers of folks that, that don't believe or are just not sure that we ever actually did it. Um, uh, you know, we, we as a nation shut it down in the seventies and, and we haven't been back. And I, I think the longer we don't go back, the more people have questions. And, uh, yeah, I, I do not endorse the, uh, you know, we never went to the moon idea, but, but I, a little bit can kind of understand where people's doubts come in maybe. Yeah, I, I do too. I do too. Um, although, you know, there's, it's like, there's always going to be people who, oh my gosh, like the Flat Earth Society, <laughs> or, you know, Holocaust yeah. deniers. You know, they just, it doesn't matter how much evidence you point to. They're just, they've got another agenda. They've got, there's a reason they, they just refused uh, to, to listen to facts. Yeah. And of course, uh, lately, the past decade or two, there's been kind of this anti science strain that I, I worry about, but uh, that's another thing. Yeah. I, I love uh, the, uh, the flat earth society meme that I've seen go around. It's, uh, members all around the globe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, it's, I remember that. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Um, Jim, what did you, what did you go to college for? What was your, uh, career, uh, path, uh, that you had laid out in front of you when you were young? Well, I was, I wanted to, uh, do movies. And okay. I went to the University of Texas. I live in Dallas now, but I lived in Austin for several years, which was a great little town back then. Now it's not. It's very <laughs> much larger and different. But uh, tech, University of Texas is a great large school, and they have a great radio, TV, film uh, department. And I took the film degree and you know saw lots of great movies, read, wrote papers about them, wrote a script or two, got out, and then life got in the way. And uh, – other things happen. I never did that. But I, I, I like to think that I learned a little about maybe narrative and story from from all those movies I watched and wrote about. Well, um, reading your book, um, the uh, there's definitely a 
uh, a narrative thread uh, through the book. It it reads like a novel. And, uh, you know, as a, I was born in, in 1971, so I missed Apollo 11 by two years. <laughs> and uh, but I, I had a mother who loved science fiction. And I remember seeing, um, you know, documentaries and, and TV specials and things like that about the Apollo program. And when I was a little kid, I remember watching rocket launches and, and, and they were, you know, probably archival footage, you know, cause I had missed it by a few years, but, um, but that, that sense of wonder, uh, was, was always instilled in me. And, uh, and, and I, you know, in the eighties, uh, one of my favorite movies was the right stuff. And, uh, you know, we had some great stories about those. Um, but your, your book reads like a novel, um, you know, based around these characters that I, that I kind of know, but I don't really know. I, I know about the things they did, but not so much about them. Uh, so I can definitely pick up on, on your love of story and, and narrative in that. You know, you, Boy, there's a few things in there that uh, I loved hearing. N- number one, reads like a novel. When I write a book, any any book of, of history, uh, whether it's about the Alamo or the Battle of the Little Bighorn or the space race and the U.S. manned space flight program, I mean, I do try to r- write it like a novel using some novelistic techniques, but but not making one thing up. That's important. Right. And, uh, you know, novelistic techniques – are things like a point of view, if if it's there, and dialogue, setting, concrete details, you know, scenes, not summary. You know, summary is uh, that's a that's a textbook, and nobody reads textbooks for fun. And yeah. the more I live, and the more I read, and the more I write, the more I realize that people like to read about people, and yeah. um, you know, a story is one thing a narrative uh the overall i mean especially this story for instance um that the science and technology involved is just off the charts as i'm sure you know and it can overwhelm a story and overwhelm the people and i really bent over backwards trying to uh bring the people alive and describe them so it's a story about people and not the science and technology or at least that's that comes through to a less, lesser extent. But one other thing you mentioned, the phrase sense of wonder. And, you know, that's something I got from reading science fiction that I, I mean, I've read, I read lots of other kinds of books now, but nothing imparts that sense of wonder like, like science fiction. You know, that of space and space travel and, and the future. And, uh, you know, this is, and all the books, uh, I read about this. One of the reasons I wanted to do this book was I read lots of books on it and I, none of them really imparted that sense of wonder. And I tried to do that here and there in this book because it's important to me because of course it, it, it goes hand in hand with my love of science fiction. Well, speaking of science fiction, I remember uh, in either the end of fourth grade or beginning of fifth grade, I, I can't remember the exact time, but I know it was around nine or ten years old, I read Have Space Suit Will Travel uh, for the first time. And, and that, as cliche as it is, it changed my life. Um, I I thought of science fiction as... Uh, as fun, as adventure, as, um, letting me see a world that could be. And I think that's what great science fiction does. I, I know we have a tendency now, um, for kind of post apocalyptic, uh, science fiction and, and the, the darker side of, of future. But I, I think that's one great thing that science fiction can do, uh, is give us hope, uh, a sense of wonder and a sense of adventure. Wow. Well, Robert Heinlein, uh, oh. yeah, he was, you know, one of my early ones, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s before the 1977 Star Wars explosion of science fiction. <laughs> uh, you could keep track of, uh, you know, read just about any everything in the genre. And the, and the three giants were Heinlein, Asimov, and Arthur C. Clarke. And Heinlein, you know, was just a great storyteller. And he, he was just really fun to, to read. And he wrote, oh, just a few kind of juvenile science fiction things like that one rocket ship galileo and a few others they were great fun i read most of his stuff uh and i agree with you there's just something about science fiction i don't read that much of it anymore because you're right it's really turned dark and um you know i 
the problem with science fiction for me is uh, nowadays I think I've developed too fine an ear and I got to have good writing and, and sometimes it's great ideas, uh, but the writing isn't fine enough for me and I just hear clunk, clunk, clunk. While I'm <laughs> I can't, I can't, I just can't take that anymore. Yeah. yeah. I, well, and, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of reading for the show and, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, digging into authors and, and learning as much as I can. And, uh, my, my reading for fun and pleasure is so limited, um, that I, I just, I'm, I'm like you. I just, I'm not going to tolerate, um, you know, halfway work. I, I want it to, I want it to be dynamite. And uh, thank yeah, God I, there, there's some really dynamite yeah. writers out there, but yeah, yeah. You, you know, you get to a point, uh, maybe it's got something to do with getting a little old. I, I, I don't have time. You know, life's too short for something that's not. <laughs> Friend of yes. mine, I was describing a book to a friend of mine and going, well, you know, it was all right. And he said, you mean it wasn't special? And, mm. you know, I don't have time to read stuff that's not special. And if I, I start a book and, you know, get, I give it 30, 40, maybe 50 pages to see if it's going to grab me. And if I don't want to turn the page then, I just throw it across the room. What's the point? Right, right. <laughs> uh, so at what point did you switch from uh, from your your pursuit of film and over to writing prose or, or writing? Well, yeah. Well, that's funny. Uh, and you probably mean nonfiction. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, um, you know, the, the film thing really at that point in the late 70s, early 80s, you there wasn't much going on in Texas. And really, if you if you were going to pursue that, you had to move out to L.A. And and I just didn't. Uh, I did a Europe trip. I was going to be a Hemingway expatriate writer in Spain, run with the bulls. You know, I, that, that that never happened. Uh, I came back, got a job at a bookstore in Austin, then um, a chain store buyer. And then I applied for a job as an editor at a publishing house in Dallas and did that. Now I'm a, uh, a literary agent. I've been doing that. That's my day job. And you know, one of my writers was, he did good history nonfiction, and he had started a book on uh, Custer and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. It was going to be a big photo book, kind of coffee table book, as were more popular before the internet. And he got about halfway through and said, God, I, you know, I don't know, I got, I got a bunch of other things to do. You want to, you want to write this with me? And I said, sure. So I read 20, 30 books on Little Bighorn and uh, wrote, you know, coffee table book. You don't need a hundred thousand words. It was like twenty five or thirty thousand words. But I realized he never came back to it, so it became my book. But I realized um, that reading that 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 there had been a whole bunch of great research and new material on the Battle of the Little Bighorn that nobody that told us a lot of new things about the battle that nobody had incorporated into a narrative of the battle, a, a lively, dramatic narrative. And so I worked on a proposal for about six months because proposals are how nonfiction books are sold. Right. And I labored over it at night for about six months and got a, an agent who was a friend of mine, and she sold it. And one thing led to another. That's how I started doing uh, nonfiction books for Little Brown. This is my third one. Wow. Um, that book uh – uh, a terrible glory, Custer and the Little Bighorn, the last great battle of the American West. Uh, when you when you start looking, we, we all know a general story uh, of of what happened at Little Bighorn and and who Custer was. Uh, when you're when you're tackling something that is so ingrained uh, in our national psyche and our uh, the things that we're all educated on in school and. And, and like we mentioned earlier, those things are becoming less and less as we get farther away from it. Um, how do you start looking for the details that make the story pop and that make the story into something that is enlightening and that makes the reader come away feeling like they, they've learned something new, but they've lived something new? Yeah, something new. That's, that's an important part of it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times – while I was re researching that and writing it, uh, you know, somebody would say, you're doing that? There's a lot of books on that. And there were. There's more books on that battle than Gettysburg. And that's because of kind of that inherent mystery. How did it really happen? Um, but, you know, I found doing these books that if you really dig 
uh, into a story. If you're writing a book about something that happened, let's say, in the last few hundred years, I'm sure it's different if you're doing a book on the ancient Hittites or something. But if there's a if there's a and I don't even know who the Hittites were. But if I know if they're from the Old Testament, that's all that's I can give you. About it. Yeah. And if there's a a written record, most I would go so far as to say most writers of history, nonfiction don't really do any original research. They don't do archival research. They look at a whole bunch of secondary sources, books that have already been written on it. But if you dig enough and you go to archives and you look for primary stuff, you can find something new. I found a ton of things new for the Battle of the Little Bighorn, uh, Indian accounts that hadn't been used, for instance, and archaeological uh, digs that led to forensic finds that just change what we know about the battle. For the Alamo, which was 40 years earlier, uh, 1836, uh, the written record was was less because, you know, it was on the frontier, it was earlier, and it was way out there in the frontier of Texas. Um, I even found, you know, some new material there. I, I hired a, a woman in Mexico City to go into their military archives and, and photograph. I gave her like 12 names of uh, Mexican high officers that had been in the battle and she went into their personnel records and, and photographed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And oh my gosh, it's all handwritten. It's written in, you know, old Spanish. It's written using military uh, slang jargon. So it was kind of tough. I mean, I had a working knowledge of Spanish, which got a lot better. And I, I hired translators, things like that. But I found new material that way. You can always find new material. And I always, you have to go to the primary sources because that's where the new stuff is. And, and um, I don't believe in total reinterpretation, but I believe in sticking to the primary sources and what they say. So many errors get into books. Uh, writers, just like I said, use secondary sources, other books, and, and errors creep in and, and continue. I found so much that was in error that had been just uh, taken as, as, you know, biblical word uh, through the years. So, I mean, you got to go back to uh, the archives and, and, and primary sources. And, you know, the more you read ab- about something, the better picture you get of, of the story. I like when I start on something, I read several overviews, large books about, you know, the whole campaign and then start taking notes on uh, other books, lesser books that are cited. I, I start living in the footnotes, end notes now. And, uh, you know, I make a list of all the primary sources because I want to look at every single one. And, um, you know, that makes a difference after after you've done that enough of that. You have a much better idea of what really happened. You've got new material that hasn't been used because you have become so familiar with uh, the standard uh, texts on the subject that, you know, when something is new that hasn't been used before. Right. Well, and when you're when you're dealing with a topic like Apollo 11, that is um, recent enough uh, in our memory, uh, yet distant enough. We're, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary, right? July 16th was the launch, and July 20th is when they walked on the moon. You're right. Excellent. Um, so we we have, uh, you know, my parents uh, watched it live on on television. I was born a couple of years later. Uh, there are uh, plenty of people that, that this is fresh in their memory. Uh, and then there are that other generation that we talked about earlier that have been have, have enough distance that that it's almost fairy tale to them. It's a thing that you know might as well have happened during the Revolutionary War as you know as far as being able to put your hands on it. Um, right. But we do have, uh, lots of primary sources for for this material right now, don't we? Boy, there was more than I realized when I <laughs> saw it. You know, and, and uh, we still have a few of the people around. Well, that was the wonderful thing. Number one, it was one of the most widely covered events in history. You know, uh, think about all the other great exploration uh, trips, expeditions. Um, you know. Weren't any uh, any any reporters with Columbus? 
things like that. And, but, you know, there was so much to read, so many transcripts, so many interviews, and especially, you know, in the last 50 years since it happened. Um, but what I wanted to do especially was I read all of those, uh, which is why this took me about four years to, to do this book. But I also wanted to talk to some of the people who were involved. And when it comes to Apollo, the Apollo program, you know, where do you stop? Thousands of people were involved. But I wanted to, to try to find some fresh stuff from people, kind of hidden figures in a way of this story that hadn't been uh, featured. Because everybody wants to talk about the astronauts because, you know, they're the glamour guys. They were risking their lives, the, the heroes, quote unquote. But there are fascinating stories behind the scenes of some of the flight controllers and engineers uh, and I hope that I could, you know, bring them alive. So I wanted to, I tried to interview some of them. I, I talked to, for instance, Steve Bales, the young guy who was uh, 26 at the time, who held the fate of the landing in his hands. He could have called an abort when all those uh, alarms started flashing 50, 40,000 feet above the surface. And the guy in the staff support room, in the back room, off the mission, off mission control that was on a single communication loop with, Bales, and he was about the only guy in mission control who knew what those alarms were. And he's the one that uh, talked Bales through it and prevented Bales from calling an abort, which have, which would have aborted the entire landing. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to talk to people who could give me some new details that hadn't that I couldn't find anywhere else. And uh, I was fortunate enough. I made a few I did a few dozen interviews, probably half the, half of them were were astronauts, you know, Mike, Mike Collins was a tremendous help. I talked to Buzz Aldrin, um, several other astronauts, and, but, but the flight controllers and engineers who were behind the scenes uh, gave, me, gave me even more. And that, that's where the real drama uh, comes from, as the, the people that, that held the information that, uh, that, that, that basically held the, the life of the project in the balance. Um, it, on their shoulders rested uh, you know, whether this thing was going to succeed or not. That's where some real drama can come from. Yeah. Steve Bales, for instance, 26 years old. Think about oh, it. I was an idiot at 26. Well, yeah, I'm, me too. And, you know, he was Guido, which is the guidance officer, which, which, uh, also means, uh, the Apollo guidance computer, that, that grand computer that was, uh, had about 72 kilobytes of memory and one <laughs> megahertz one megahertz i don't even know if you say megahertz with one is it megahertz uh, <laughs> of, of, of you know processing and but it was extremely reliable is rope core it was uh you know hundreds of little you know copper wires you know tied around little little metal cores and connected here and there and, um, you know, it, it didn't do much, but what it did, it was very reliable for, but nobody knew what these, uh, you know, those, those, um, alarms were anyway, he was 26 years old. And just a few months before, uh, the, uh, the flight, the mission, he, uh, Guido position was given abort clearance and he could call an abort if he thought, it was too dangerous. And he was terrified of that. He didn't want to ever have to invoke that, of course. So he was really worried when uh, the mission started. And uh, very reassuring to hear is uh, the uh, 24-year-old computer guy in the back room, Jack Garman. Uh, he was such a computer uh, whiz. They, they gave him the nickname Garflash. Well, it's not that – not that uh, – um, catchy. These were engineers, not poets, but uh, <laughs> he was 24 on a loop and, and he was just uh, kind of calming Steve down and telling him this is cool. If they don't if they don't repeat within a few minutes, it's cool. Just ignore them. And of course, he said, we're go. We're go on those alarms. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of primary sources and going back to the original material and then how uh, historical events get reinterpreted uh, and, and then those reinterpretations tend to become lodged in our uh, in our thinking about things. Uh, have you seen the new movie uh, a few months old now? I think it was called Man on the Moon um, with uh, uh, what's First his name? Man? 
first, first, first man was it was it yeah. what it was yeah with and Ryan Gosling I was, I was trying to think of the the pretty Canadian guy yeah um, yeah <laughs> have you seen that I have seen it yeah what did you think well I I well I love that director uh, Jamin Damon Chazelle I loved La La Land but uh, and he's a tr- fantastic director and I liked parts of it a whole lot I love the I guess you'd call them the, the action scenes, the spacecraft scenes. It starts with X-15, which is fantastic. In the middle, you've got that great, exciting sequence involving Gemini 8 with Armstrong, uh, where a stuck thruster started them spinning into a whirly gig going more than one revolution a second. They were about to black out, but his smart, his skill and, and coolness under pressure got them out of it. That was fantastic. You never see Gemini in a movie. And, of course, the final you know, sequence, uh, the launch of Apollo 11 and the landing was just, just, just fantastic. I, I was less crazy about the, the personal stuff, which they always feel they have to insert to get people to come, you know, the, the family stuff. I, I, I didn't like their, they made Buzz Aldrin out to be more of a, 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 a kind of a jerk and a buffoon than he, than he was. And that, that's, that wasn't fair, I, I think. Um, but, but no, I liked it. Uh, what I just saw a couple nights ago that you, you need to see is, is Apollo 11, this documentary that just opened Friday, which is unbelievable. Yeah. They, I cannot they, wait to see that. Yeah. That's- this trove of new, uh, film, some of it, some of it 70 millimeter that they shot. It was just in the archives that, and it's done very cleanly and, and wonderfully. And no, you know, voiceover, dramatic voiceover, except you hear Walter Cronkite, who was, you know, the the guy back then as far as announcers but the the launch itself is so overwhelming it, it gave me goosebumps and and brought tears to my eyes well i saw an imax which helps but that's a tremendous movie i can't wait to see it um speaking of new footage and and uh new sources that have been found uh you know that's one of the tropes that gets uh trotted out uh, from the people that deny uh that, that the space program ever happened or that we landed on the moon or, you know, whatever it is, is that they say, well, all, you know, all the original films have been destroyed and, uh, and things like, it. but that's not actually the truth. Is it? They, the, the, um, the urban legends kind of get boosted by these half truths that, uh, that get spread around. Yeah. It happens all the time. I'm not as familiar with their arguments and the, you know, the, the evidence for it. I, I know there's lots of, of places online that you can go to um that that answer everything you know like the crazy why don't you see stars you know you know on that apollo 11 or any of the the missions how come you don't see stars in the sky which as far as i know is just a a, you know some law of physics uh, and, and photography but um well, I forgot what you asked me. You know, we're talking about original sources and that there there are yeah, plenty okay. of original sources, aren't there? Well, as far as I know, I mean, I, I didn't know that they were destroyed. You know, I mean, you've heard some crazy stuff. You know, Stanley Kubrick actually shot, you know, on on sets left over from uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which he did, in the, you know, the that had been released the year before. I mean, it's just nuts. I mean, if there's anything, I mean, I'm a skeptic. By nature, I mean, I'm an empiricist. You got to show me the evidence for lots of stuff. But and there's things I'm I might be skeptical about, like you know the JFK assassination and and Roswell. But but this isn't one of them. You know, there are 400,000 people involved, contractors, subcontractors, NASA people, and you know, it's it's just not possible that it was faked. I mean, and if they wanted to fake it, it's very difficult. And why would they fake it seven times? Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, one thing that uh, that I heard a lot of early grumbling about uh, for that the uh, movie First Man was that they didn't show him planting the flag, um, the American flag, and you know there's a you know certain voices were uh, louder about that. Um, but in in the movie, to me, um, that was not the point of that scene, and the the scene did exactly what it needed to do. Um, when you're when you're um, writing a book like Shoot for the Moon and you are 
uh, you have all the information, every little detail that happened. How do you start choosing the narrative and how do things get left in and how do things get taken out? Um, because you can't tell every little detail. So what is the decision process like when, when you're telling your story uh, of what happened? Well, that's a great question because with any story where you've got a lot of material, for instance, uh, the little bighorn, um, when I turned in my manuscript to my editor, I got it back from him, you know, about a month and a half later, and there was all this, you know, red line slash diagonal lines through an entire page, which, you know, almost knocked me out of my seat. But he should have had, he should have had a little stamp to substitute for as many times as he wrote in the margin, don't need this level of detail. <laughs> and he was right. You know, uh, I, these – all this stuff becomes so important to the writer and you've got to pull back from it and look at it as a story. I try to think of it visually and, you know, think of if I'm getting bored by something, you know, readers probably are too. Uh, for instance, this book you just read, Shoot for the Moon, you know, once they land on the moon and then, I mean, that's the next to last chapter. And the, the last chapter is, you know, the walk on the moon, their return, and the wrap-up. Uh, you know, I just kind of got a little bored thinking, you know, the climax was the landing, and then the walk was a little anticlimactic, but, you know, still part of that. After that, you know, how much how much material how much how many details do we need in them coming back basically doing the same thing that they did you know a few days before re reversing it and so i just really kept that concise but that's a very good point it's it's tough as i as i said my little bighorn book uh, i didn't do it properly but i could you need an editor or somebody i have readers read my uh, uh drafts after i've polished them and um you know, I tell them, please tell me what's wrong with this. Please tell me if something gets boring. Please tell me, you know, if there are too many details. Don't tell me it's good. Tell me how to make this better. And I rely on them a lot. And I have people that I trust to tell me, you know, give me the, you know, honest feedback. Jim, what is the planning process like for a book like this? You know, when we're talking to novel writers, uh, people like to put themselves in one of two camps, uh, plotters and pantsers, uh, people that write by the seat of their pants or heavily plot out a book. The, the reality is everybody is somewhere in between uh, those two things. But when you're writing um, a narrative nonfiction like this, there is no – room for flying by the seat of your pants. Um, uh, so how do you begin the, the, the planning process for this and how long does it take for you to settle on what your narrative thread is? Well, that's a great question. Another one. Um, and I love pantsers. I love that plotters versus pantsers, but, and that makes sense. I, you know, like for instance, Elmore Leonard, um, I've heard just, you know, came up with some really interesting characters, got them in an interesting situation and then kind of let them take over and see what happened with them. But you, you can't do that with nonfiction. Uh, but you know, here's, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you my process. And if I get to a point where it's too long, just yell at me. But I, like I think I've mentioned, I start reading lots of big overview books. Then I start taking notes. I start making lots of notes about other books, sources, things like that. I, I research. I do nothing but research for about a year and a half at least, maybe two years. I want every account there is. If someone's alive who was there, now with my first two books, they weren't. But, you know, with this book, of course, they were, lots of them. But some of them were gone because it's 50 years ago. Uh, it was 45, 46 when I started. So I wanted to talk to as many of them as possible, and I and I think I did. I like to visit the setting wherever possible because that really, when you get to writing about uh, the events, you can write more confidently about the setting, which I think is very important when you're writing a setting a scene. Um, of course, I couldn't go to the moon, so that wasn't as necessary here. But I made visits to uh, Cape Kennedy, which, of course, at that time was Cape. Well, it was Cape Kennedy 
uh, in in 69, while it was Cape Canaveral before 63. And of course, the Houston uh, Johnson Space Center, which still has the uh, old mission control room, the Moker Mission Operations Control Room, and that's pretty wonderful. They're thinking about uh, refurbishing. I think they just got a grant to refurbish exactly like it looked in 69 or 70. Um, I start making – I start – keeping separate files on roughly kind of chapters. They might not be exact chapters, but they're like, uh, for instance, this one. Uh, I wanted, I like to put my events in context. So I don't start off instantly with chapter one, you know, the launch. And I didn't start, you know, Terrible Glory with chapter one, the battle. Uh, it doesn't even happen until about two-thirds of the way through. Same thing with the Alamo, same thing with this. I like to put things in context and show how we got there, which I think makes it a richer story. And so I start keeping files on, you know, where I'm going to go. After a while, I just sort of – I start getting an idea. I don't outline, you know, heavily. It just doesn't work for me. I start getting a feel in my head for where I'm going to start. And I wanted to start this one, of course, with Sputnik. You got to start it somewhere. And I started with Sputnik, and which was kind of the beginning of the space race, because I did want to do the first half of the book with the, the rest of the space race. And so I have a chapter on, you know, 1957, 58 Sputnik. And then maybe the, it starts flowing from there, you know, uh, the formation of NASA in 58, which was a reaction to Sputnik and the, the you know, frenzy over you know the russians are going to drop atomic bombs from you know satellites overhead and then it got after a while you sort of naturally you know what's next is mercury so i keep a big fat file on mercury fat file on gemini apollo so once i do that when i'm finished mostly finished with research although you never completely finish because there's always loose ends, always things you're doing while you're writing also, at least for me there is, I start writing on yellow legal pads with a Pilot G2 pen. That's what works for me. It's fast enough. I can write fast enough, uh, and it just works for me. And when I think there's uh, like an end note or a foot, which is what footnotes are now, I put it in the uh, margin roughly, or a quote that I need. I'll just put a note that, you know, fine quote, things like that, if I know that there's a quote that pertains to some of this. And, of course, I'm, I've am i got my file on that chapter or that sequence open, and I'm looking through, constantly rereading that. And, you know, your mind's a fantastic thing. It, it, when it knows that you've got a problem that you're working on or uh, something that you're trying to figure out, your mind works even when you don't even know it's working, you know, when you're sleeping. I'm a, I'm a runner, uh, and I run a few times a week, and I can't tell you how many times I'll be running, and boom, something pops into my head. You know, Einstein used to walk around the streets of New York, and I think definitely that helps, you know, physical activity. But I, I keep on rereading that era, that, that the file on that time that I'm writing about, and, you know, you start – with a, for me, it's very important how to get into a chapter. So, because that kind of sets the scene for the entire rest of the chapter. So it's important. The beginning is important. The first few lines, and if I've got that, kind of the rest flows. You start. You kind of know. I, I work on a paragraph or two, and then you know continue until I finish that chapter. I try to write a chapter as kind of a story in itself, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. That kind of hopefully segues into the next one and just labor on that. When I finish a chapter, I keyboard it and do some polishing. And then I continue until I've got the book done. And then I go through again, you know, uh, you know, fleshing out people in the story as much as possible, because as I said, people are important to a story um, uh, I, you know, revise for clarity, the right word, which is so important. I change passive verbs to active. 
I have a tendency to write long stories with dashes and colons and semicolons, and I, <laughs> and I change and I change as many of those as I can to uh, shorter sentences because, of course, sentence structure and sentence length is really important in writing because even if you write a perfectly composed sentence, da 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 da, da comma da 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 da, if you keep on doing that and using the same structure. Um, it gets boring to the writer. It's like a metronome. And so you've got to use some variety, some shorter, punchier sentences with longer. Vary those. And I, I, when I get to that point, then I read aloud. And when you read aloud, you find lots of other things, clarity, structure. You stumble over things that don't make sense, things like that. You probably know that. And, and that's I, when that cadence really comes out. Absolutely. And um, that helps a lot. I didn't do as much of it for my first book, uh, A Terrible Glory. Um, and I did I did some of it for reading aloud for uh, the Alamo book, Blood of Heroes. But here's something funny. When I I actually did the uh, the voice narration for the audio book for the Blood of Heroes, uh, the Alamo book. And I sat for about Seven, six or seven days in a studio from 10 to four or five with a, you know, sitting on a stool with the text in front of me. Uh, and behind, you know, glass was the, was the engineer on the other side monitoring everything and recording it. And on a loop uh, in New York was the editor, the little brown, uh, manager of uh, audiobooks. And, you know, she'd hear me slur something and she'd say, Hey, could you do that from the top? Anyway, I can't tell you how many times I, start a sentence and halfway through <gasps> I have to take a breath and I tell him who the hell wrote these long <laughs> and, and that really made an impression on me so in the last book this Apollo book I, I really made more of an effort to read it aloud and, and try to keep the sentences manageable although you know a nice long sentence well constructed with the proper dashes or commas there's nothing wrong with it and uh, my longest sentence was during the launch. I wrote a long sentence that was, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 lines. And I told the editor, I want to keep this because I want this to be one thing, the launch, just building on each other. And I wanted it to have that effect, and hopefully it did. Well, and, and when you've taken care to go through and shorten what you can, keep your uh, your sentences punchy to the point – um, then that long sentence, that's it. It, uh, it preserves the power of that sentence because you've not overused it. It makes even more of an impression. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's what I hope for. Because if they're all long, you know, especially attention spans these days, don't get me started. But, you know, and even mine, I feel it, you know, with, with uh, screens and, and iPhones. I mean, bing, 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 bing. You know, it started with MTV and now here we are. Um, you know, people are less inclined to read, tolerate much longer, you know, Jane Austen like sentences when, you know, they had all the time in the world and the only thing competing for their attention was, well, I don't know what else there was besides books. There weren't, it wasn't radio, TV, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, these days you can't have too many, too many long sentences, I don't think. Um, Jim, you know, in the, in the middle of the book, uh, is, uh, is a fantastic collection of images, uh, that have been included. Um, uh, NASA has been, uh, it's fairly famous for, uh, their, uh, openness with, with materials. And I've, I've got some friends that wrote letters to NASA when they were kids and they would send them whole packets of information and stuff like that. Um, what kind of access did you have to uh, archives and, and did you get to choose uh, some of the images that were included? Well, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I actually sent off for at least one uh, to NASA for a signed photo of some mission. And for the life of me, I can't find it. I wish I could. I don't think it was Apollo. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they used to be great about that. Well, I did. I made several trips to Washington, D.C. and um, where I spent a few days each time looking through uh, NASA's uh, in their history office. They've got tons and tons of files, of course. And I found some new information there that I had never seen used before. I mean, you know, talk about digging. 
And actually, there were a few uh, interviews done with some astronauts on cassettes that I had to listen to there that hadn't been transcribed. And so anyway, that, that was well worth it. As far as images, how it works is that, um, you know, anything uh, – NASA, all NASA images, photos are, of course, government property, and they are in the Library of Congress National Archives, and they belong to all of us. So they are in the public domain. So anything that NASA, any NASA images are in the public domain, and anybody can use them. So that was wonderful. I I looked through, oh my God, hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand or two thousand images to get the right ones because there's so many and. Uh, my one disappointment with the book is that uh, to get all these images, and because I wanted to tell also this story from Sputnik to 11 in the images, and there's three photo inserts on slick paper, and they do or they are chronological. There's about 75 images, and it's I'm just it's just unfortunate that so many of those great Apollo images just stunning, you know, Earthrise, you know, that famous photo and uh, had to be used so small to be in this book, unfortunately. Well, it's a, it's a, an absolutely um, stunning collection. The, the story is amazing. Um, the, the entire package is, uh, uh, is fantastic. I cannot uh, recommend this book enough. Um, it's available everywhere now when people are hearing this shoot for the moon by, uh, James Donovan on the cover. Um, th- Jim, you, you've done an extraordinary job, uh, with this book. Uh, it's available now in hardcover, Kindle edition and audio book. Um, Jim, what do you hope people take away from this book when they close the back cover or, or finish the audio? What do you, what do you hope they're left with? There's a few reasons I wanted to write this book. I, I think I mentioned to you that uh, there's many books on the Apollo program, not that many on just Apollo 11. Uh, and some of them are very good. But there were there wasn't one on just Apollo 11 that really imparted that sense of wonder that you and I have talked about. And I wanted to try to impart that and tamp down the science and technology so it's about people and you know, and also, of course, you know, all these mostly younger people who some of them think that, you know, it didn't happen. I really hope that this opens some eyes and, and helps settle that question that this really happened. And, you know, the, the, the phrase American exceptionalism gets it's been kind of hijacked these last few years with negative, negative uh, connotations. But I think occasionally it's it, it still applies and this is a story that I'm proud of as an American that it, that we did it um, this is American exceptionalism in its most positive sense well there are places where national pride uh, is is uh, acceptable and not only acceptable but warranted and I, I think this is one of those like you said uh, this is something we can all be proud of because this is our story um, as, as people. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, this was uh, – I'm not the first one to say this, but the 20th century, you know, hundreds of years from now, thousands of years from now, will probably be known for two world wars and maybe the splitting of the atom and uh, the first time humanity left the earth and traveled to – an alien world, another celestial body, and walked on it. I mean, it's, it's a baby step, but I think it's uh, incredibly important because I think more is going to happen. I, I, there's there's more interest in space now than there has been in 50 years. Um, it's just amazing. I think I'm sure you've noticed that with books, movies, uh, TV. It's just amazing, and uh, SpaceX and all these commercial enterprises. And I think uh, eventually we are going to be on Mars and in other places, maybe thousands of years from now, because you know, as, as long as there's part of us that's human, uh, we'll want to know what's on the other side of that hill and what's in the next valley, and uh, then it's going to be what's you know in the next galaxy. Yeah. And, and we can look back and we can see where those seeds were sown, uh, 
that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, Jim, if, if people want to learn more about you and, and dig into your work more in your back catalog, is, is there a place they can find you online? Yes, thanks. Uh, there's uh, I've got a website um, that is being updated with Shoot for the Moon, and I think it will be uh, on up in uh, a few days, and it's just uh, jamesdonovan.net talks about my books with reviews, articles, links, all sorts of cool stuff. Excellent. Um, Jim, it's been such a great pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I'm going to send everybody to get their copy of Shoot for the Moon. Uh, I'll put links to the uh, where they can buy the book and your website in the show notes uh, today. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Hank, I really enjoyed this. It was a pleasure and a privilege. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. They made instant coffee and laid blankets over a pile of hay. He helped Kate pull off her boots. She volunteered for first watch, but Jason couldn't sleep. Talk to me, he whispered. Kate sipped her coffee. She sat silhouetted against the soft navy sky. A field of stars hung above her. The constellations peered in through the windows and slats. How about a story? Sure. My mom used to tell this one. It's the legend of the star maidens. He watched her words as she spoke, her story illustrated by puffs of vapor that mixed with the steam of her coffee. Long ago... A Mohican brave became lost in this valley. He'd followed a red deer deep into the woods, but the deer had vanished, and as twilight fell, he lost his way. He searched the heavens. He saw a bright star and followed it. It shone upon a clearing in the woods. Spook rock lay at the center, emanating magic. And in the starlight, he discovered the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He discovered a star maiden, she was dancing with her sisters, and all seven were naked. Oh, really? Jason whispered. Seven naked star maidens? Shh. Why do these things never happen to me? The brave decided he must take the star maiden for his wife. So he seized her and threw her over his shoulder. And she loved him for his courage. They married and had a son. Then what? Then it gets sad. The star maiden missed her home. She gazed at the sky every night. She loved her husband and her baby very much. But she missed her sisters, and she especially missed the dancing. So she snuck away one night and returned to the sacred rock. And she begged her sisters, Please appear. Please appear to me for one last dance. They came to her and took her into the sky. Kate's silhouette swayed. One last dance. It was wonderful. And when the dance was finished, they sent her back to Earth. She thought that she'd been away for only a little while. But that one dance had taken many, many years. She ran back to her husband, back to her baby. But they were gone. Her home was empty. The hunter had stopped waiting for her. He'd given up hope that she would return. He'd taken their child and had left with his tribe. One last dance had cost her everything, and she had no home at all. Jason could sense something roiling inside Kate, some brew of feelings that the story had stirred. He wanted to leap up, to grab her and carry her off, his star maiden, and wife. She climbed up to Spook Rock. She heard no music, only wind. She died there of her grief. She dwindled and lost her star form. She became a will-o'-the-wisp, fluttering between the trees. And see that constellation? The Pleiades. Those are her seven sisters, watching down from heaven. And, to this day, if a girl has lost her true love, she can go to Spook Rock and dance, and the star maidens will bless her. They'll grant her one wish, any wish at all, except one. They can't make her true love return. <laughs>